When I lived as a monk, I was trying so hard to be a monk. And now I've realized that that's just one part of me. I love being a, a messenger through media. I love being a thinker. I love being a content creator. I love, I love being so much more than that. And that's such a big part of my identity. It still is a massive part of my life. It's, it's the foundation of who I am, but it's not all of me. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every single one of you for learning, listening, and growing with us every single week. Now, you know that I'm always trying to find new minds, new people, thought leaders who have insights that can help me learn, listen, and grow. And then I want to share that with you. And today's guest, when I first read about her, I was blown away immediately and I knew I had to have her in the studio for this conversation. And so we finally are here. She came all the way. She's with us in person. I'm talking about none other than Maya Shankar. Now, for those of you that don't know, she's the Senior Director of Behavioral Economics at Google and is the creator, host, and executive producer of the podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, where she interviews fascinating guests that I can't wait to talk to her about. She previously served as a senior advisor in the Obama White House, where she founded and served as chair of the White House's behavioral science team, a team of scientists tasked with improving public policy using research insights from human behavior. Maya, thank you so much for being here. Uh, your resume is phenomenal. You have an incredible set of expertise. I secretly wish I was a behavioral econ uh, economist. So <laughs> I love hearing that. That comes from my f behavioral economics has been like my passion since I was 15 years old, and I'm not smart enough to to be one. Uh, but I get to sit with you today and get to pick your brain. So thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you and to be in person with you, uh, which feels so special at this point in time. Yeah, and we've already been talking offline and getting on. So anyone who's listening to this podcast. You're in for a real treat. Uh, Maya is so warm, so uh, relaxed, so just just such. You have such a warm energy about yourself. I know you were saying that about my wife, but you you have the same. I, I need energy to tell your listeners. Um, so knocked on the door, and Ravi, Jay's wife, opens the door. <laughs> has no idea who I am. Um, I'm with my friend Madeline, and she <laughs> greets us in absolutely the warmest way. She's like, hello, welcome <laughs> to my home. I have no idea who you are, but I'm going to be effusive and warm anyway. And I was so struck by um, her presence and, and that kind of energy. And then of course you walk up the stairs and you have exactly the same vibe. So I know why you guys are married. It's no, very sweet to see well, that in action. <laughs> well, we felt the same from you immediately as well. And I feel like we're old friends already yeah, in the way that we're talking. And I want, I want to go back because I do want to use this as an excuse to get to know you better. Uh, but let's go back to the beginning of your journey. And I read that you were off to become a really successful violinist. Uh, and that was the path that you were on until you experienced an injury. Uh, I want to hear about that journey, your fascination with music, and tell us about how it all started out. Yeah. So when I was six years old, my mom went up to her attic and brought down my grandmother's violin that she had brought with her all the way from India wow. when she immigrated to this country. So it was one of those few things that she carried with her. And when I was six, she brought it down from the attic and, and showed it to me. And she had only meant for me to see it. She said, oh, you know, I want, you know, this is this is your Pati's instrument, right? That's how you say grandmother in Tamil. And um, I, I looked at it and she noticed that I was so quickly taken by the instrument. Um, I very quickly asked for a pint-sized violin of my own, and she went to the store and got me a quarter-sized violin, and I was infatuated. I mean, my mom never had to tell me to practice. Every day I'd rush home from school, go upstairs, open my instrument. And I assure you, Jay, I didn't feel that way about everything I was studying <laughs> in school, but the violin was something that just felt like it came so naturally to me. And so when I was nine years old, you know, I was that classic kid with really big dreams and no idea how to get there. Um, my mom and I were in New York. And now my parents have no connections at this point into the classical music world. Um, and so, you know, my dad's a theoretical physicist. My mom helps immigrants get green cards in this country. They had no idea how to facilitate, you know, this transition for me. Um, but then my mom is such a fearless go-getter. So we're walking by the Juilliard School of Music in New York one Saturday. I happened to have my violin with me and she said, Maya, why don't we just go in? 
what do you mean, why don't we just go in? We don't have an invitation. That's why we don't go in. That's nuts. And she's like, let's just go in. Let's see what happens. What's the worst thing that can happen? I was like, well, I'll tell you the worst thing that can happen. I'm going to get rejected and it's going to be terrible. And my mom didn't care. She's like, we're going in. So we walk into Juilliard uninvited and we stumble upon um, a fellow classmate. And my mom says, hey, would you mind if uh, my daughter auditions for your teacher uh, today? I know, you know, we don't have the formal invitation, but that would be wonderful. And they were so generous and kind. And I auditioned for him and he accepts me into a summer program. And then six months later, I auditioned for Juilliard and get accepted. So wow, then that I was, is amazing. <laughs> yeah, my, my mom is, she's taught me so many <laughs> lessons, but one of them was don't wait for, you know, that silver plate, just create it, right? Yeah. Um, and so that began my journey of just being so in love with violin. And when I was a teenager, Itzhak Perlman asked me to be his private violin student. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate to this, but when you're in a deeply competitive environment like Juilliard, you don't really know if you have what it takes to succeed. And so when Perlman took me on as his student, that was the vote of confidence that I needed, that like, oh, maybe I do actually have what it takes. And so I was even able to convince my parents that I should, you know, I wanted to go pro and they were finally like, okay, fine, you don't have to do the liberal arts education. You can go <laughs> to a conservatory for college. So I had everyone on board. And then like you mentioned, when I was 15, I had a son in hand injury. And um, basically overnight, doctors told me that I could never play the violin again. And as you can imagine, I was just completely despondent because the violin had played such a formative role in my life up, up until that point. Um, I felt like I was first and foremost a violinist, right? It was my identity. And, you know, there's this interesting uh, insight from cognitive science, which says, uh, which is about this concept called identity foreclosure and refers to the fact that we can get really fixed in certain identities, especially in adolescence. I mean, it can carry through into adulthood, but certainly in adolescence. And I fell prey to that. I kind of felt like for the first time ever, I was asking all these existential questions about myself, like, who am I? You know, who am I without the violin? I'd never thought to ask myself that question before. And in many ways, um, having being forced to pivot at that moment in my life has given me a much more malleable sense of self, a much more malleable identity. And I think that's served me well as I've, you know, endured life's twists and turns. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I can't imagine what it feels like to be that age and be told you can't play an instrument again and, you know, something that you've built up such a close relationship with over nine years. I mean, tell us about what you were feeling. How did it affect your confidence? Because I'm guessing at that time as well, when your identity is wrapped up in being a performer or being a violinist and you have this incredible mentor and then that's taken away. What does that, what did that feel like? And you know, what, what did that kind of push you towards? Mm. What, what changed about you at that point? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, I resisted it for a while. I was the impatient teenager that was like, I'm going to get through this. Damn those doctors. I don't care what they say. Well, actually those doctors were super right. And I needed to just have listened to them from the beginning. Um, but I think what it taught me was something very important, which was it was much more stable and sturdy for me to attach my identity not to a specific thing, but to the traits of that thing that lit me up. Mm. And so when I dug deeper, I realized, you know, my child brain thought, well, I love the violin. I love the instrument. I love the way it feels. I love the sounds it produces. But actually, Jay, the thing that really got me ticking is the fact that my instrument allowed me to forge a close emotional connection with people almost effortlessly. So imagine I'm a kid, right? Nine years old. I go onto a stage. There's thousands of people in the audience that I've never met before. They've never met me. And within moments, I'm allowing them to feel something they've never felt before, mm. right? We have some sort of emotional intimacy and bond that's forming between us just because of the music that I'm playing. And I realized like, well, that's what... I'm actually passionate about. It's human connection. I mean, that's probably why I responded so much to your warmth, right? Because that's genuinely what makes me tick in life is connecting with other human beings, trying to understand what motivates them, what pains them, what brings them joy. And I feel like that led me down this path to studying the human mind in all of its intricacies, right? The science behind the human mind. And in many ways, it led me to this new podcast I've been creating, A Slight Change of Plans, where... I have this license now to go into a room and interview people like Hillary Clinton and Tiffany Haddish and others and say, hey, uh, Hillary, apropos of nothing, um, 
<laughs> what is your biggest insecurity? <laughs> What's the hardest moment of your life? You know, you can cut through all the pleasantries and just really dig deep. And I think when I look over the course of my life, um, that is the common thread. It's mm. this deep desire to emotionally connect with those around me. And I've just tried to find that in other pursuits. And, you know, for those listening, I feel like if you're going through a hard time where you're being forced to pivot, try to identify what features or traits of things that you like, and then yeah. try to engage in an exploration to figure out where else they might exist in other domains. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that point. I think that's so powerful. Like we get so obsessed with activities mm -hmm. and identity shaped around activities. And it's not about activities. It's about the aspects, the subtle things, the the role you get to play, the relationship you have with that thing that makes a difference. I, I often say to people, like people think like, your purpose is to be a speaker mm. or your purpose is to be a podcaster. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, none of those are a purpose. They are vehicles and they are platforms and they're modes of sharing a message. But the purpose is the reason why you do it and your intention and what you put into it. And I think we all get so lost with like, well, what's the activity that I want to do? Exactly. So I, I love how you broke that down and simplified that. But you also gave me a few good uh you also gave me a few good questions to ask you now based on what you've been asking <laughs> other people. So I'm going to be using them on you. Uh, I was going in that direction. I wanted to know since then, what do you think is the most difficult experience you've personally gone through since then? So that was obviously a big thing at 15, 16. What since then has been probably the biggest personal challenge that you feel you've been faced with? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, it's hard to identify a discrete moment. Mm. I think the biggest challenge one faces is growing into themselves. And I think for me, if I were to summarize the biggest challenge in my own life, it is, it is the acceptance of certain parts of my personality that I wish were different, <laughs> that I just need to be okay with and to manage in life in spite of those things, right? Um, Give me an example. I'm incredibly impatient. I want everything to have happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that impatience can have lots of negative. I mean, my mom would always say when I was a kid that she's like, before I know it, you were running across the street. You wouldn't wait for like the light to turn. She's like, I was always terrified something was going to happen to you. So I've always seen my impatience as being a negative thing. Mm. But then I think about the parts of my life in which that impatience has really served me well. So mm -hmm. a good example of this is, um, so quick backstory. So as I mentioned to you, I discovered cognitive science and I ended up becoming an academic. So I did my PhD, I did my postdoc in cognitive neuroscience. And I remember there was this moment, um, I was in the basement of, I was at Stanford at the time. So I was in the basement of an fMRI laboratory and I was scanning this guy's brain. I'd probably been in this windowless room in the basement for about five hours at this point. So he comes in and within moments I'm peering into his brain and I'm thinking to myself, Given my personality, I feel like the order of operations is a little off here. <laughs> like, I don't know whether this guy has kids. I don't know what he's passionate about. I don't know if he has children. I don't know what his favorite ice cream flavor is. These are important questions, Jay. I don't know anything about <laughs> him. And yet I'm peering into his brain, which feels really intimate. So I th remember thinking to myself, I'm too social for this. Like, I, I need to pivot in some way. And I didn't know what to do, because what does a postdoc in cognitive neuroscience do other than become an academic, become a professor? So I ended up talking with my undergraduate mentor, who I know you know, Laurie Santos. Oh, um, I didn't realize that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. So she was my oh, freshman. I love Laurie. <laughs> oh, my, I did not know that. I don't know how I missed that. Yeah, yeah she's one of my closest friends. Oh, I and, love Laurie. Um, yeah. has been an incredible mentor to me ever since freshman year of college. Oh, amazing. I can share the story how we met at some point later. But anyway, um, I call her up and I'm, I'm saying to her, uh, Laurie, so the thing I've been doing for the last 10 years, I'm kind of in like a JK moment where I no longer <laughs> want to be doing this, but what the hell do I do next? Should I try to become a general management consultant? Like, I don't understand what, what I can do. So she tells me, Maya, um, there's this incredible work happening in the White House right now where they are using insights from our field, from the science of decision-making, and it is changing people's lives. So for example, they are changing the default settings in this school lunch program that helps low-income kids eat lunch every day. And instead of it being an opt-in program, they're making it an opt-out program so that all eligible kids are automatically enrolled without the need for a burdensome application or the stigma associated with signing up your kids for a public benefits program. And now parents only need to take a step if they want to actively unenroll their kids from the wow. program. So as a result of that change, 12 and a half million more kids were eating school at lunch every day. So I'm thinking to myself, 
Um, so this gets to the impatience piece, right? Thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I, I want to have that job. Um, but that job doesn't exist. Uh, it just was work that was happening. There's no role for a behavioral scientist. And so I go home that day and uh, I, Laurie, Laurie makes you know, some connections for me. And You fly to DC and walk into the White House <laughs> like you walked into Julia. That's, that's what happens, right? It's actually pretty close to that day. <laughs> I send Whoa. a cold email to an Obama <laughs> advisor. He doesn't know who I am. I'm riding off the coattails of famous people like Laurie Santos and Cass Sunstein, who wrote the book Nudge, and they're helping guide the way. Um, but I basically interview with a White House official two days after I send this email. Wow. I move to DC without having a formal offer letter. I remember I sold everything in California other than my bike. I signed a one-year lease in DC, and I was like, I'm here whether you all like it or not, because <laughs> I need to be here. So that impatience kicked in. And then it really kicked in when I was at the White House, where... I had this big grand goal to build a team of behavioral scientists and I wasn't given a mandate or a budget to do so. And that impatient personality really helped me thrive there where I refused to take no for an answer. I pushed people every day. I was like, every day matters in this administration. And look, we had no idea what was coming next. But even from that vantage point, you know, every, every day mattered so much. And so I, um, I feel like accepting the parts of myself that I haven't always liked and trying to figure out if there are silver linings to those traits. Like my husband and I will often do this, even in our relationship, right? Where I'll be like, I'll be like, Jimmy, you're being too much of a people pleaser. Like you need to just say no <laughs> to the person. And he'll remind me, he'll be like, you know, Maya, the fact that I can be a ple people pleaser sometimes does make me a very loving husband. <laughs> you know, I am very kind. I'm like, oh, you are really kind and loving. You're so right. And so I think my husband, Jimmy, has helped me if, if we can do that with each other, remind each other that traits are complicated and complex yeah. and they have pros and cons, then we should give ourselves the same compassion. You know, we should, yes. we should constantly remind ourselves. Um, and he, he, you know, he was teaching me by role modeling it with himself. Um, I should remember that there are also some pros. I love that. Is he a behavioral economist too? He's actually uh, a software engineer. Okay, right. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, is he like... You know, but he's very wise. I yeah, feel like he very, is a behavioral economist at times. Uh, I can I that. can I ask you that same yeah, question though, which is: it. Is there a trait in you where you didn't always embrace it, but you've learned over time that there might be a you know, it's a double edged yeah, sword in some no, way. No, it's really interesting. When I, when I think about, I, I'd have to stop to think about if there's a trait. I I feel that way about when when you started talking about that. The first thing that came to my mind was, and I've been feeling this a lot lately, and I've been talking about it. It's this idea of when I lived as a monk. I was trying so hard to be a monk. Mm. And now I've realized that that's just one part of me. I love being a, a messenger through media. I love being a thinker. I love being a content creator. I love, I love being so much more than that. Yeah. And that's such a big part of my identity. It still is a massive part of my life. It's it's the foundation of who I am, but it's not all of me. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a married man and I, and I love being married. And I love being an entrepreneur and I love strategy and marketing and I love all these things, which yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't think a monk likes all those things. Mm. And so it took me a lot of time to kind of unravel what that identity was, where I saw myself as such a long part of my life or such a deep part of my life as a monk. Mm. And now to realize that's a part of me and not all of me. Yeah. And and I think so I'm I'm trying to think of a trait to give you a more specific answer. I think I've always been pretty self-assured mm. and so I think I've turned stuff probably earlier than yeah. people would and that's either that's my illusion or delusion and I'm okay with that but the, I'd say that intensity I always talk about intensity mm. as one of my traits. I'm a very intense person if I'm focused I'm very laser focused. I and that causes a lot of issues because yeah. I can have tunnel vision. I can be completely dedicated and obsessed with something and not care about everything else mm -hmm. for that time. But I've also realized that's what helps me learn and grow quicker and accelerate and move forward. And so I, I actually think if, if you look at every one of your traits, you're right, you'll find a pro and a con for every trait we have. Exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and you have to, I think we have to learn how to use them in a way that helps us serve ourselves and mm -hmm. serve others, as opposed to use them in a way that forces other people to have to change. And I think that's the part, I think that's the part that I'm becoming more and more conscious of as a trait is the trait of being extremely focused on something shouldn't stop you from being aware of other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think if I can get that subtlety right, 
then then I'm going to win. Yeah. But if I don't have that subtlety, I've worked with so many clients that that's exactly the subtlety they didn't have. And then that led to destruction of their families, their marriage, their personal lives or whatever it may have been in the pursuit of greatness in a certain regard. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does make yeah. sense. And it's making me think too, as I'm listening to you share this with me, I think, well, of course you should embrace that, Jay. That's what makes you so special and unique and rare. And of course there's a silver lining. Like look at your life, look at the positive impact you've had on so many. And what I'm realizing is that I so effortlessly see other people through that lens. But because I think as people, as humans, we're just so hard on ourselves. We yeah. rarely turn it around and say, well, why don't you view yourself with that same complexity? Yes, and maybe yes. that's the, that's been the hardest thing I've gone through is trying to use that same amount of compassion with myself. Yeah. And, I, and, and if it's not our place to say, I also think it's, it's the difference in gender and men and women mm -hmm. too. I do think that I have male privilege in that you are just a bit more self-assured and more confident because it's been reaffirmed. Whereas from the studies I've read, and you could probably speak to this a million times more than I can, but women are more likely to look at a job description and think, oh my gosh, I can't do seven out of those 10 things. Mm -hmm. Whereas a man will look at it and go, oh, but I could do three out of 10. That's good enough. And that kind of discrepancy, I don't know how you feel about that and how that affects it, but. Yeah, no, I definitely, yeah. I mean, the studies are really compelling showing yeah. that there are disparities and um, you know, it's reminding me nobody's immune to those effects. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, so for my podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, you know, I had the honor of interviewing Hillary Clinton. And what that interview taught me is that Hillary Clinton didn't come out of the box, Hillary Clinton. Mm. She had to go through her own personal journey and development and also resolve a lot of the insecurities and anxieties that you and I are talking about right now. So I remember mm. she was telling me, she was sharing this story about how she just left the White House as, as First Lady. And she'd always been tethered to her husband's identity, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that had been the role that she had played. And she was very productive in that role, but it wasn't her role. And she so fervently believed that women should run for offices and be mm -hmm. in leadership positions and be in power. So she was motivating all these people around her to do that. And one day she was in an event um, promoting women in sports. And this basketball player leaned down and whispered into her ear, dare to compete, Mrs. Clinton, dare to compete. And she said she was astonished in that moment because no one had said it to her like that, but she realized suddenly, maybe I'm too afraid to do the thing that I've been asking everybody else to do. Maybe yeah. I don't think I'm good enough. Maybe I don't know if I have what it takes and if people will like me and if I have the right presence for politics. And that was so powerful to hear from someone like her, yeah. you know, wow, even Hillary at times felt this. And then to see where she's come from there, I mean, mm. talk about inspiring, right? She was able to overcome all of that and um, go on to in accomplish incredible things. And I think that experience showed me that we all have this kind of, I mean, it, it sounds so cliche, but it's so true. It's like we all have some degree of self-doubt. Yeah. And it's just a matter of finding ways to manage that and learning from other people's experiences. Absolutely. I wanna I wanna backtrack a bit to first of all, having South Asian parents and being <laughs> encouraged to play the violin and go to Juilliard and then like just your whole journey. I'm 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 fascinated by your parents sound amazing. They are uh, wonderful. Tell us a bit about what it was like. Like what did you feel that other children in the South Asian diaspora were encouraged in the same direction? Did you feel like an anomaly? I wanna, I wanna hear about how you felt on that journey because it's very unique. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure whether other South Asian kids were following that journey at that Did time. Did you have because, a lot of South Asian because kids Because I grew up, yeah, I was gonna say, I grew up in a primarily Caucasian wow, okay, um, hometown right, 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 and yeah. we are one of the few families of color anywhere. Um, was, how did that feel with like, tell me a bit about that because yeah. I think that the South Asian experience in England is very different than the South Asian experience in the U.S. So yes. I'm intrigued. I, I think I was so eager to assimilate. Everything from, you know, I have like textured hair. And I remember going to a birthday party and all the girls with the smooth, shiny hair got, got like the pretty scrunchies. And I was given a headband. I was like the one girl that didn't get, I mean, <laughs> clearly I'm over this, Jay. It's not like I still remember it. I know, and I'm laughing, and I'm laughing. That's the worst. No, 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 totally. But it's like these small things. Um, I just so desperately wanted to be yeah. um, 
like the girls that I saw at school. And, you know, my dad remembers when I'd write all these stories as a kid, I wouldn't use Indian names for my characters. Mm -hmm. It was always Catherine and Lindsay and Katie and, you know, and so, um, it took me a long time to really feel comfortable in my skin. And I think one thing that actually helped me on that front is, well, one, I'm one of four kids. So I always felt a huge sense of tribalism. Like mm. it's my family against the world, you know? Mm. Um, and my parents were always deeply proud of being Indian. And I loved that. I mean, especially looking back, you know, it's like, my mom is a brilliant chef. She made us amazing meals. At the time, I was like, we should just get pizza. And I'm like, oh, my God, I had gourmet food in my home growing up. Yeah. How could I not have appreciated it? Um, so they were fiercely proud of being Indian. And while I rejected it as a child, I think I grew into it. And then, you know, now I'm fiercely proud to be Indian. And it's funny, one of the jobs that I had right before grad school was working at Sesame Street. And um, I worked on the Indian version of the show. No way. And wow. yeah, there's an Indian version. And what I love about Sesame Street, Jay, a lot of people don't know this. I love is Sesame that, Street. Is yeah. that it changes young children's minds mm. um, in ways that families can embrace. So for example, in this was back in the day, I don't know the show, how the show's evolved, but in the South African version, the main Muppet character is HIV positive. Mm. She's always taking her medications on time. It's reducing the stigma around HIV. Wow. And then in Israel, the main Muppets, one is an Arab Muslim and one's an Israeli Jew and they're best friends and they both love hummus and they bond in all these ways. And in the Indian version, the main character, Chumki, is always wearing her backpack. She's committed to going to school. It's all about, you know, young girls thriving in school. Wow. And so what I did was um, I worked to domesticate the Indian version of the show so that families in the United States could have it, so that young kids growing up could feel the sense of pride that I wish I had felt it as a youngster, but only came later. Yeah. So they could grow up hearing languages like Hindi mm -hmm. in their homes and grow up seeing young kids, young Muppets, yeah. eating Indian <laughs> food, eating with their hands, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was a very interesting experience for my parents to come here. And, you know, my older three siblings got a lot of exposure to Tamil, our mother tongue. By the time I came around, you know, they were like, oh, I, I think the kids should just assimilate. You know, like, no, every, we're, all, we're all just figuring this out for ourselves. <laughs> um, but I did spend my graduate years um, in England. I did my, my DPhil. Uh, and it did feel like the South Asian experience was very different there. So I don't know if any anything I've shared resonates or doesn't resonate with your experience. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of it does, actually. Like the idea of, I think, in your early years to kind of be embarrassed or shy or unconfident about your mm -hmm. Indian experience. So like when my mom would make me an Indian lunch to take to school, <laughs> like I would eat it in the corner and hope that no one could smell it or whatever. And, and now I'm, I feel the same way as you do. My mom made amazing food and... You know, I you're right. We had gourmet meals at home, and mm -hmm. I'm I'm I was when you were saying that all I was thinking was dosa, and I'm, I'm yeah. a massive fan. <laughs> and so I was, you know, but the idea of just like starting to understand the value of that culture and then sharing it out. But I love what you were sharing about Sesame Street. I didn't, I had no idea. So I wish I had that to watch too. I didn't have any of that to watch when I was growing up. So yeah. I can imagine the the impact of that. Tell it. Tell us about. You know, you've been studying human behavior. That's your fascination. It's yeah. your it's your deep passion. You've done it at the highest levels and are doing it at the highest levels. What's something that you've learned through that about human behavior that scares you about humans? Mm. Like what's something that's kind of like difficult or uncomfortable mm. as a researcher to come across and then you're trying to figure out or reconcile how to hopefully aid it or cure it uh, or help fascinating question. I've never been asked that before. And it's such an important one to ask because we have to be honest about the human condition and human nature. I think the scariest thing, um, given the state of the research right now, is that while it can be easy to inspire behavior change in people, it is incredibly hard for people to change their minds. Mm. And I think as a culture, as a society, we are experiencing this in spades right now in a time when things feel incredibly divided and divisive. And, um, you know, we can't even have a, a normal Thanksgiving dinner anymore, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's tragic. What I've learned is that, you know, we know that people can disagree even on empirical matters, right? Like, is climate change real? Or mm -hmm. is the coronavirus real? Or does gun control reform actually reduce gun deaths? And it's tempting for people who have a more empirical mind to think, oh, well, I'll just give them more facts. This is just the result of an information gap, right? Mm -hmm. I can easily fill the gap just by showing them the data, showing them the evidence. Mm -hmm. 
But we know from research that this is missing a huge part of the puzzle. And the piece that's missing is people do not generate their attitudes and beliefs just based on facts. Mm -hmm. They generate their attitudes and beliefs about the world in part based on their membership to different groups yeah. and the values those groups hold. Mm. And so there's this really interesting um, study. It's actually from the 50s, and it involved uh, controversial referee calls during a football game. And they had people who were fans of opposing teams watch this footage of these controversial calls. And even though they were watching exactly the same footage, their assessments of these calls vary considerably based on their group membership, based on their team loyalty. Wow. So those people who were fans of one team tended to feel like the unfair calls were in their direction of and vice course. versa, yeah. right? And what's astonishing to me about that research and the reason I mention it is it's not like these folks are consciously aware. Mm. Oh, I know that I'm not able to be biased. I know that I'm seeing a warped version of reality. Of course not. This is their reality. Mm. And it shows how potent these group memberships are, that they can actually affect people's perception of reality. Mm. And so what that means in practice is that when it comes to bridging divides, we need to use different techniques than just throwing information at people. Yes. Um, one of my favorite uh, findings from behavioral economics, to your point about whether we can ameliorate some of these concerns, mm. um, comes from a domain called um, moral reframing. And it's research that shows that it's much more effective to hold people's values as fixed and present an argument or present a position in ways that affirm those values rather than threaten them. Mm. So for example, um, if you are trying to convince a conservative to care more about the environment, you might frame it as caring about the environment means preserving our nature's beauty, our, nat mm -hmm. our natural beauty, right? It is patriotic to care about the environment. Mm -hmm. If you're talking with a liberal, you might focus on the fact that investing in climate change uh, reform can actually help elevate those with socioeconomically underprivileged status, right? Mm -hmm. It can help them thrive. And so in both cases, it's the same policy objective. Yeah. You're trying to get people to care about the climate, but you are taking to account what their existing value systems are yeah. so that they don't feel that in agreeing with you, they're threatening their tribal membership. Yes. And that helps me build a lot of empathy for people right now because let's take the coronavirus, right? It's so easy to think it's just a mask. It's just a damn piece of cloth. <laughs> like just wear one already. I promise you it'll make you safe. Yeah. But when you look at it through the lens of psychology, through cognitive science, you realize wearing a mask for a person can carry huge symbolic significance mm -hmm. and it could potentially threaten the relationships in their life that they hold most sacred. And so when you have that in mind, I just think it's the, in general, I think studying the human mind is the greatest empathy yeah. builder that exists out there because the minute you uncover why it is that a person has a particular belief, then there's an element of understanding yes. that allows you to approach the person differently and for them to approach you differently potentially and for you to try to make, uh, to meet halfway, you yeah, know? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That was a beautiful answer, by the way. And, and, you know, as, as scary as it is, you are right that the study of the human mind is potentially the only antidote because mm -hmm. then you start to see how you're caught in, the own, in your own trap yourself. And I think that's the hardest part. As you're saying with those fans, they couldn't see that they were being really biased or, you know, that they were getting lost on one side because of their affiliation. Mm -hmm. And they just couldn't see that. And not being able to see that, not being able to step back and be an observer and take your take the home jersey off, take the away jersey off, and just be the referee yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's that's almost like we need referee vision. Like you need to be able to see the game as hopefully an unbiased referee would to be able to truly make the right calls. And uh, sorry, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And I also think the wonderful thing about being in my field is that it is serving up solutions yeah. um, and is giving us tactics that we can use in our day-to-day -day life when we converse with those we disagree with. Mm -hmm. So um, I was talking about this with Adam Grant, who I had on my podcast love recently. Adam. I love yeah. Adam, huge fan. He, um, he's wonderful. And I was talking about how I had interviewed Daryl Davis for, for my podcast. And Daryl Davis is a black jazz musician who 
was approached by a member of the Ku Klux Klan when he was performing at a bar one night. Wow. And the guy at the bar said, hey, I love your music, man. It's, it's incredible. And then Daryl finds out that this man is from the Klan. Um, and he, he, he starts to ask himself a series of questions like, how is it that these people can hate me without even knowing me? And so he, he ends up pivoting in his life, talk about a slight change of plans, um, and ends up inspiring hundreds of people to leave white supremacy groups. And it's an astonishing story of how someone who has every card stacked against them, even in terms of personal safety, mm -hmm. having these conversations, conducting these interviews with members of the Klan, could find a way to penetrate their minds and ultimately get them to make one of the greatest leaps we can see in yeah. terms of mindset change, which is going from believing in absolute vitriol to turning their backs on the Klan. Yeah. And what I loved about my interview with him, Jay, is that so much of what he was sharing is corroborated by the science. So we know when it comes to changing people's minds, certain tactics are very effective. You wanna show genuine curiosity for why that person has their beliefs. Um, you wanna increase your question to statement ratio. So you're asking them, well, how did you arrive you know, at this belief in the first place? And what evidence would in theory change your mind? What would you have to learn in order to think differently about this? And one reason I love that question is that it presupposes that they ought to be willing to change yeah, their mind yeah, yeah. in the face of evidence, which is not something we can always take for granted. And then there's other techniques, like you try to affirm that you're not questioning their morals. You're not questioning their values or their humanity over the course of the conversation. You're just simply trying to understand why it is that they believe in something. And then I think the most powerful one, and this is something Daryl shared with me, is he doesn't like to say that he changed people's minds. He likes to say that he inspired them to change their own minds. And the science there corroborates that beautiful, poignant statement, which is you want to recruit their own sense of agency. Yeah. You want to make them feel that it was them who decided to change their minds. You arm them with new perspectives, with information, with your own personal story, but let them wrestle with all yeah. that. And then the sturdiness of a mindset change that a person themselves inspires is far greater than yeah. trying to impose a set of beliefs on someone. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I often find that when when we're presenting something to someone and they're not taking up to it, we think it's because of their weakness. Yeah. When often it's our weakness in the presentation, right? It's mm -hmm. like if something's not been clearly articulated or presented to someone or in a way they can digest it, they may not remember it and they may not understand it, but the responsibility of that falls so much more on those of us that feel we know mm -hmm. and are sharing this new way or alternative path. Yeah. And, and I found that so much so in, you know, in the work I do when I'm working with people on, which effectively is changing their behavior. And I very early on, a lot of people would ask me like, don't you get frustrated when someone doesn't start meditating after you've been telling them about meditation, whatever it may be. And I'm just like, I don't, because I know how long it took me <laughs> to start meditating. So it's safe to, to tell you now that I don't meditate, even though I know I should. Totally That's fine. awesome, because I know you're yeah. going to be empathetic. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Because it's just, first of all, I know how long it took me. Second of all, I know I know how hard it is. Mm. And, and I've seen this research on people's minds. and I haven't done it, but I've seen it and read it. And I can also just recognize that I still haven't said something that lets the penny drop for them, mm. right? Like I, I, there's somewhere where I need to go. And, an, and usually what I found is it's not what I say or even what I do, it's an experience they need to have. Yeah. And that's kind of the question I've always been asking is what experience has this person not had yet mm -hmm. that will help them change their mind? Because if they have that experience, then that's theirs. Kind of what you're saying, like then that's theirs to keep. Yeah. But if their experience is only through what I tell them, then that's not their experience, it's my experience. Mm. And so for me, it's always been about creating and facilitating experiences and experiments for people to help them get their own research and data and their own conclusion uh, rather than saying or doing anything. And so I'm always fascinated by how, how you can use experiments and experiences to, to help people have a new, you know, a newfound solution that they didn't even comprehend before. Yeah, I love the way that you just said it. That's my experience, not theirs. And it reminds me, you know, one of the women that I interviewed for A Slight Change of Plans, her name is Megan Phelps Roper, and she grew up in the Westboro Baptist Church. I don't know if you're familiar with this church, no, but it I'm is um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, I think refers to them as the most rabid hate group in America. So mm. they are 
homophobic, anti-Semitic. Basically, they hate everybody who's not a member of the church. And they do abhorrent things like show up at military gay, like gay military funerals. They wanted to protest the Sandy Hook shooting. I mean, it, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And Megan grew up in this church. Her grandfather was the founder. And she was absolutely indoctrinated. I mean, she was steeped in the ideology from a very, very young age. And be, she grew up to become one of those more one of their most ardent vocal advocates for the church. And people engage, end up engaging with her on Twitter, actually, in this very compassionate way that you and I have been talking about, where they tried to just help her understand that maybe there were a few holes here and there. Mm -hmm. That's how they, you know, the very slow process. And they would reaffirm her humanity. And um, they would just point out some inconsistencies, like the moral reframing stuff that I was saying. But they, would, they wouldn't say, Megan, what you believe is batshit crazy. <laughs> they would say, <laughs> you know, actually, there's a few issues here and there. And <laughs> what she says, so she ended up leaving the church in her mid-20s, which meant leaving her family behind and leaving basically everything she ever believed to be true behind. And I asked her this question, right? I said, how do you think about your family, right? And the fact that they haven't left. Like, wh what gives you hope? How do you think about your former self, you know? And she said, I don't try to detach myself from my former self, even though I disagree one million percent with what that former self was like, because I can then feel close to the person that I was, and the person that I was was someone who was persuaded by absolutely terrible ideas, and then one day saw the light. And that gives me hope that if my family experiences the same thing that I experienced, if people treat them in exactly the way they treated me, maybe there's hope for them too. Mm. So it's exactly what you just described, where, is, where she knows, I can't just, I'm not able to just tell them that yeah. this is wrong, but I'm hopeful because yeah. I saw that journey in myself. I am a convert. And so I believe that if I can just set up the right environments for them to get that kind of exposure they could potentially lead to. Yeah, it's that idea of like, people don't have a remote control that has the fast forward button on life. Mm. So you can't see the future implications of your current action. Yeah, And you can see it around you, but it never feels you. It never feels like it's about you. And so I, I, the reason why it resonates so strongly with me is because, and we spoke about this a bit earlier before offline, but... I was someone who experimented with a lot of drugs when I was young, but mm. I never got addicted, obsessed, or never really got into doing something for a long period of time. And the only reason why that happened is I met one of my friend's aunts who was an addict, and I saw her have a fit in front of me. And it was such a traumatic experience where we thought she was going to die, and she didn't, thankfully. We, you know, we called the ambulance and everything else. But it was like, it was such a, like traumatic live event of seeing someone mm. who was an addict to a particular substance to then go through that in front of us as young men and for me to go okay I'm never messing around with this stuff ever again wow. and it was like an experience and it's the same way I think about what you were saying earlier that facts don't work like we know every cigarette pack has <laughs> the label the label yeah. and it's never worked They're like you know it, that doesn't stop people but when someone loses someone in their life or when someone hears about someone un getting an unfortunate diagnosis mm -hmm. because of one of their habits, it, it starts to change their mind. Tell me about something that, we talked about traits that you've started to see both sides of. Mm. Do you think that works for everything or have there been certain behavioral changes you've made in your life that you felt just had to be transformations for you? So I think for me, uh, exercise has been the thing that I really had to introduce behavioral changes around because I've seen... I almost don't do it for fitness reasons, Jay. I do it for my mind. And it is so powerful for my mind. Um, like the days that I work out versus the days that I don't feel totally different to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually used some behavioral change insights to motivate me <laughs> to exercise. So I'll share one of those with you. Yeah. Um, it's an insight that was generated by my friend, Katie Milkman, who's a professor um, who studies change. And it's called temptation bundling. And the logic behind this is to pair up an undesirable activity with a desirable activity. Mm. And you're only allowed to do the desirable activity if it accompanies the undesirable one. Wow. So one of my favorite things in life is to discover a new pop song, okay? <laughs> I'm into all of it. Like, of course, Taylor Swift, 
Um, I guess Casey Musgraves isn't pop. She's someone I interviewed for my podcast and yeah. I love her music, but she's, you know, she's genre defying. Yeah. Um, but I love discovering a new song, but I know because of the way the brain adapts that I'll only get like 30 or 40 really good listens yeah. out of a song before it becomes old hat. Right. 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 And so I save it. I only listen to these songs when I'm on the treadmill or I'm lifting weights or I'm on the elliptical. And my poor husband, because he'll be like, oh my gosh, we're cooking dinner. Let's play the new Casey Musgraves <laughs> album. And I'm like, we do not play recreationally, okay? <laughs> it needs to be saved for these sacred moments when I'm working out. And so uh, it's been wonderful to like, you know, even though I study change for a living, even though I'm a behavioral economist, I fall prey to all the same human biases yeah, yeah, that we course. all fall prey to, of course. And so I'm using these strategies every single day in my life to try to optimize and, and reach some of these longer term I goals. I love that one. So wait, <laughs> is there research that actually says you're only going to get 30 to 40 plays out of a song? Is there research that goes along? No, this is just the Maya okay. formula. I have no idea what it is for you, Jay. Um, right. I think given your, your, your monk days, you're probably closer to like 100 because you'll see right. dimensions of the song that I can't possibly appreciate given your depth and my relative superficiality. Reality. Um, but for me, it's about 30 and then I'm done. That's amazing. Um. <laughs> that is such a, no, but you know, that's brilliant. I love that. That is the most interesting, unique piece of advice that I think, you know, that that's going to help so many people who are, I can imagine everyone now talking to their partner or their friend today going, I turn that song off right now. Like <laughs> I'm only, I'm only using yeah. it for those painful moments exactly. in life. That's genius. I love that. And, and that's a, a Maya Shankar original <laughs> Special. I, I love that. It's brilliant. Uh, tell us a bit about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I find like, you know, you have this role at Google and you're studying human behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. I find there's two questions here. The first question is, tell me what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. What's fascinating about it? Because yeah. I have no idea what you do on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis. Uh, the, more, the more interesting question for you probably will be the second one, which is what is an area that you think behavioral economists haven't really uncovered or mm. understood yet because so when i've read books about behavioral science or behavioral economists it's been about the relationship between money and human behavior the relationships between uh everything from lying and stealing and human behavior mm. through to you know about the different character traits or the idea of giving and service and human behavior but i'm wondering what's an area that you're fascinated to uncover and you think we're just scratching the surface on we don't actually know a lot about yeah, I love that question. I think one area, and this is actually something I was also talking about with Katie Milkman, is how durable some of these behavioral change insights are. Yes, such a good question. Uh, yeah. It's so hard because behavior change, that's a one-time thing, like the decision to sign up for retirement or get your COVID vaccine or remember to call your mom on her birthday. That's a maybe a once a year type of commitment yeah. or maybe a once in a lifetime type of commitment. And then you're done. Mm -hmm. And from a public policy perspective, we become excellent at this. So I remember when I was working in the Obama White House, um, I was able to work on a lot of these nudges where you shift just one thing and then the person's life potentially has changed forever. So I, I talked to you about the school lunch program, right? You mm -hmm. make that one change and now millions of kids are getting lunch at school every day. Or I worked with military service members um, in order to help them get enrolled in retirement savings plans. And again, that's like a one-time decision and then they're done. The ones that are much harder are the day-to-day -day behaviors mm -hmm. where we have to build these habits over time and sustain those habits over time. And we just haven't cracked the nut fully on how to encourage long-term behavior change yeah. on the things we value most. And that's because we're human, Jay, right? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're fallible, we fall prey to temptation left and right. I mean, it's just very, very hard to be a highly disciplined, disciplined person, right? That's yeah. probably one of the reasons why you recommend everyone that they meditate because that can help with sustained behavior change. Um, but it would be wonderful to see additional innovations yeah. um, within that space. Yeah, I love hearing you say that because I found that at least through my own mechanisms and work, I've kind of found like a a trifecta that gets closest and the challenge is that a lot of behavioral changes you said is not around anything that is consistent mm -hmm. and so for the three levers that i found that at least in my work that, that really do help people are coaching consistency and community mm -hmm. that have a massive impact on people and we built a program three years ago now that was centered around these three areas mm -hmm. 
And through our research and studies, we've been able to see how people have become happier, more successful, more financially free through the program. Yeah. And of course, we're dealing with we're dealing with thousands of people, not millions of people in that program. But it's it's phenomenal to see how those three things together, coaching, consistency, and community, mm. are so powerful. Like coaching gives you that insight and advice. Consistency is the one I think is yes. ignored in in everything. It's like, like you said, you do that one nudge. And that doesn't create a cascading, life-changing effect. And so that consistency of weekly Mm check-ins. And then finally, the community aspect of having a group of people that you're doing it with has been so powerful. But yeah, tell me what you're doing on a day-to-day basis and what you're discovering and learning. I think the consistency piece that you just mentioned is really interesting. And there is one potentially powerful antidote for this that comes out of behavioral economics research, and that's called the fresh start effect. And it's the idea that when we have these really big life changes, these big milestones, like we move to another town, or we buy a home for the first time, or we get married, or we have kids, or we take a new job, those moments in time can serve as breaks from our past and all the habits that we used to have. In many Mm. ways, we can take on a new identity in this new role. And what research shows is that people are far more effective at introducing a new kind of consistency or sustained behavior change when their surroundings are physically different. They don't have some of the same cues and reminders every day that might inspire them to, you know, eat the chocolate cake versus the fruit salad and um, their commute to work is different. So now maybe they're going to walk versus take their car. Um, And so I do believe in the power of fresh starts and Mm. you don't necessarily have to wait for a major milestone. Sundays can serve as fresh starts. (laughs) Like certainly January 1st can serve as a fresh start. Um, Every Monday is a fresh start for me. I'm one of those people that's <laughs> yeah, like, me too. There's just, just too looking, many damn I'm just Mondays. waiting for a new day. <laughs> exactly. But we found, for example, that military service members, again, this is work I was doing in the Obama White House, were more likely to sign up for a retirement savings plan on the first day of spring when right. they were reminded that it was a new beginning and a new start to their to their future lives. And so I really do believe that if if your listeners are struggling with that kind of consistency and are looking to build a new set of habits that better align with their long-term goals, look out for that mo- those moments in your yeah. life where you're breaking from the past and you can reestablish yourself and the kinds of behaviors that you aspire to associate yourself with can be more present. Yeah, I, I can agree more. I think uh, I've always used a new job or moving to a new town or joining a new group as being an opportunity to redefine my identity in that space (laughs) of who I want to be. But uh, yeah, no, the idea of just using, I remember when I moved from, so I got introduced to spirituality, like just on the cusp of leaving high school and going to college. Mm. And so college is where I got to redefine who I was. Whereas at high school, I was a rebel and a troublemaker and all the rest of it. And then all of a sudden I went to college and I was like the kid who meditated and, and everything else. And it was so great for me because I was no longer held down by that baggage of the mm. identity I had crafted for myself where people expected me to be a certain way. And then of course, after leaving being a monk and coming back into the world, it was easier to always come back and be like, oh, I don't go to that or I don't drink or I don't do this because I'd had this life experience. Whereas if I would have joined the corporate world before, maybe I would have had a very mm. different experience. So I, I completely can relate to so much of that advice. Yeah, I love seeing this insight play out in your life. I'm wondering, you know, when you went to college, was it a really intentional action to, to change? Like, yeah. were you seizing that moment? It was, it was, because I think I'd, I'd created such a role that I played at high school mm where I was, like I said, the rebel, the troublemaker, the person who was a funny drunk. Like I just had a role that I'd created. It was a role. It wasn't me. It was just just a identity that I enjoyed being yeah. because people enjoyed that version of me. And none of my, and I took a gap year before I went to college, which was great because all my friends went off to their respective colleges and lived their first year lives and all the rest of it. And I went to a college where none of my school friends went. And so I had a complete blank slate where no one knew who I was and there was no history and I could completely reframe Mm. who I wanted to become. And so I ran a philosophical society every week at college and I I meditated and everyone would come to me to learn these skills and techniques I was learning from monks. And it was almost like I I could be the person I wanted to be. And I think that helped so much. You know, this reminds me of another insight from behavioral economics. It's called identity priming. Mm. And it refers to the fact that our behaviors often align with the identities, the social identities that we either 
associate ourselves with now or aspire to associate ourselves with. And I think your experience underscores the importance of, especially when you're young, not allowing people to give you labels. Yeah. Because the moment you're given a label, the rebel, the yeah. funny drunk, whatever it is, you feel some degree of pressure to assimilate totally. to that or, or to ensure that your behaviors are aligning with that identity day to day. In part, it's just to reduce cognitive dissonance within yourself, right? You want to believe that your identity means something and that you're living it out every day. And, um, you know, this was true in, in when I was talking with Daryl Davis, who says, you know, it's sometimes it's important to label behaviors as racist versus people as racist. If you feel like they're redeemable, that they can mm -hmm. change. Um, because if you give people a label, they will carry that with them and it might not mm -hmm. facilitate the same kind of change. Um, and I remember when I was working with the reentry population while at the White House, we were designing guides for people who were leaving prison. And, you know, the transition back to civilian life can be a very challenging one, but it's also a fresh start in which mm -hmm. we want people to tap into their best selves and reach their goals. And we were very careful in this guidebook, this transition book, to not refer to people as former convicts or ex-convicts mm. or ex-prisoners. Instead, we called, we made sure that the, the, the labels we were using were community members, mm. job seekers. Mm. Those kinds of labels are forward-looking, can allow people to use those identities. So yeah, it's just your, your personal experience transitioning from high school to college allows me to see how important it is that we just, we don't let others label us and we also don't label, label ourselves, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I love that. I love that how simple, even when you were describing that, just hearing those words changes how you view that person, mm -hmm. even for the new people that are going to get to meet them. And I think so many of us are carrying around old labels and old baggage and old identities that we don't want to be anymore. I yeah. think I meet so many people who are like, Jay, I don't want to be this person anymore, but all my friends think I'm this person. And so I love the idea of, you know, at least starting to test who we want to be in new, new phases of mm -hmm. our life and new places of our life. Uh, you've mentioned the podcast throughout the conversation of these amazing conversations that you're having. Yeah. Tell me about why you decided to start a podcast and why you called it a slight change of plan? Because I love the t I love the title, but I want to know the reason for why you did that. Yeah, um, I think it was in part inspired by my personal experience with change. You know, losing the violin at a young age and asking myself all these existential questions about identity. It's in part inspired by my role as a cognitive scientist, right? Someone who studies the mind, and I, I was eager to marry, you know, these two the the narrative storytelling part of my life with the cognitive science part of my life. But the catalyst for this happened in 2020. And I was feeling really overwhelmed by the pace of change that was happening around me. And I know everybody was. It was this collective moment in the world where we all so acutely felt a loss of control. Um, we realized how much of an illusion control is. And it was easy to feel intimidated. Uh, that would be the best word I could use to describe my state of mind as someone who loves planning and, and mm -hmm. likes knowing how things are going to end out and then also seeing all the tragedy around me and the racial upheaval, like it, it, was just, it was just a hard, a very, very hard time. And then I tried to put on my cognitive science hat. And what I realized is, while the specifics of what 2020 threw our way wasn't, was absolutely unprecedented, our human ability to navigate change is not. In many ways, our minds are built for change. Mm. And that's really important for us to recognize because as, you know, as a human civilization, we've done this rodeo many times before, this change thing. But there's no textbook out there with answers. It's not mm -hmm. like in the throes of a huge life change, you can go to your textbook and open it up to page 90 and be like, ah, oh, yes, here's the path that I should take. And so I thought to myself, why don't I try to find people who have been through extraordinary change in their lives, right? People like Tiffany Haddish and Hillary Clinton and Casey Musgraves and Tommy Caldwell, and then just a bunch of people I've either heard about or met in, in my personal life, and hear their reflections and try to mine their stories for insights and lessons that we as listeners can take back into our own lives that might help us think differently about change in our own mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. And it has been an absolute joy to make this podcast. I mean, I've never felt more closely aligned with something given who I am. Remember I told you about the basement of that fMRI yeah, lab? The podcast yeah. is the opposite. <laughs> that is actually the thing that I, I just, I mean, I've fallen in love with it. And I think the reason is that, 
you can meet people with two very similar sounding stories, but how they define their change moment mm -hmm. will be radically different. The Absolutely. lessons that they learn will be radically different. And so I feel like, I mean, this talk about eating a slice of humble pie. I have been so humble doing this podcast because my guests have taught me so much about change that I never would have appreciated absent listening to their stories. Mm. And it's been wonderful to go on this expedition with them about how it is people have navigated some of the toughest changes that you can imagine in life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Living, living or not living, who'd be someone that you are fascinated about the amount of changes in their life or, <laughs> or those transitions in their life? I mean, there's always Oprah, but that's yeah. the obvious one. <laughs> you know, what's interesting, Jay, is that when you meet someone, you don't always appreciate the full depth of their life story. So I'll give you mm. one example. One of the people that I interviewed for this podcast, his name is Scott. He's just a friend and colleague of my husband's. I'd had dinner with him once back in 2019. And he is a self-proclaimed health nut. So he sounds like you and Ravi now, right? So he's vegan. He does intermittent fasting. He does high intensity interval training. He adds turmeric and chia seeds to like his food whenever possible. Now, look, we're both Indian, so we know that turmeric is a delicate spice. You yes. do not pour it on anything. Totally. This guy is adding turmeric <laughs> to his food. So if it's in a book somewhere yeah. um, saying that something's healthy, he's done it. And then in 2020, Scott got a stage four bone cancer diagnosis. And within weeks, he had to get his right leg amputated. He had to pack up his bags, move to MD Anderson in Texas, do 18 administrations of chemotherapy. He also had to get a vertebra removed from his spine and I think his tibia was removed from his other leg. Scott's worst nightmare came true. He, he had literally spent his entire adult life trying to avoid this outcome. Wow. Now I talk to him and I'm interviewing him for, for this podcast and he's telling me he's in the throes of it all when I'm interviewing him. Um, he actually just finished up his treatment yesterday. Um, he says to me, you know, Maya, my worst nightmare came true, but I'm sitting here in my backyard sipping a cup of coffee and I'm realizing the emotional thermostat has prevailed. I am more or less as happy as I was before the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Sure, the bad moments are worse. I'll give you that. Nausea is intense. The pain is terrible. I have moments of fear. But the good moments are just as good. And he said, if I had known that I would respond this way psychologically, I would never have been as fearful of cancer as I had been in the first place. Mm. That's so stirring to me. And those are the kinds of insights that I carry with me, you know, because they give me hope and they make me understand just how resilient we are as people. Um, not everybody has Scott's story. You know, mm. I'm not sure I would respond in that way, but he didn't think that he would respond in that way. Mm. And so I love it when a guy I just had dinner once, you know, I can have this kind of conversation with and he teaches me, he gives me so much wisdom. Yeah. And another thing he shared with me is he said, you know, I put so much emphasis. My identity was so intricately entwined with my fitness up until this point. Like, I was smart, fit Scott. Like those are the two labels, you know? Mm. He's like a Harvard grad and all that stuff. And he said, this whole experience is allowing me to see that maybe these traits that I saw as so core to my identity are more negotiable than mm. I thought. He used the mm. word negotiable. And I love that. He goes, <laughs> yeah, maybe I can't do a handstand, but like I'm still Scott at the end of the day. And the final lesson that I learned, well, I learned so many lessons. One of the final lessons I learned from Scott's interview was he said, you know, my, it would be a shame if my body deteriorated and my personality also got worse. So <laughs> I'm going to use this to become a better person. Yeah. And to me, that was a testament to the fact that this is a trait I see across all my guests is we are natural storytellers in our hearts. You mm -hmm. know, no matter what your spiritual or non-spiritual beliefs, it is just human nature to try to find meaning and silver linings in adversity and change yeah. to, to almost justify the yeah. randomness of it all. And um, hearing Scott be so intentional about that mm. growth and, and saying, look, I need to just make the best of it. Um, I love that. And I yeah. think that's, that's such a powerful story. So maybe, maybe the, to your earlier question, I think my dream guest is someone who just 
teaches me something new, helps me yeah. see the world through a different vantage point. You know, yeah. they don't have to be someone I've already heard of. I just love seeing the world through different lenses. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a beautiful answer. And uh, I, I'm so glad you shared that journey. I just, um, on Saturday, I got the news that my my best friend, who was my, almost like my brother, who was a monk, he just passed away after wow. suffering with colon cancer for four years, but it had spread far beyond his colon. It was everywhere. I'm so sorry to hear and that. And so he like, I don't know how many cycles of chemo he had, like 30 or something like that. And it was just, every time it would, they'd feel it's gone away, it had gone somewhere else. And I got to speak to him on the phone about three days before he passed away. And I didn't mm. know, obviously we'd, you never know. Yeah. And I got a message from one of the senior monks who was with him and said, oh, we're just talking about you and we're thinking about you. And so I called him straight away and it was like, he'd gone to London for his treatment. It was like 11.40 PM in London and 3.40 PM here. So I called him up and I got to be on FaceTime with him. And he was like completely emaciated, like hunched over, but he was smiling. Like he just had this massive wow. smile on his face. And he was like that throughout his whole cancer journey. And I could tell that this was the worst I'd ever seen him because up until every time I'd seen him because he was taking treatment, he looked normal, mm. as in not normal, that's the wrong word, but he looked his usual self. This was the first time I'd seen him uh, completely, you know, emaciated and in bed. Mm. And he was just smiling away and we were joking around and he, we were both telling each other stories and memories and he'd lost his voice. So he could only like really whisper mm. and the senior monk knows us both. So he was kind of helping speak for him and translate for him and, Ad for him. And it was just remarkable to me to see someone uh, at the end of their life be so blissful. Yeah. And all I could see was bliss that when I spoke at his memorial yesterday, it was the most blissful memorial I've ever... I was on Zoom, of course, everyone was there in person in England, but it was the most blissful memorial I've ever been to because that was him. Yeah. And, and that's from what you're saying about Scott, it sounds like a very similar energy of mm. how to deal with this. And, you know, while he was at cancer, he was... Uh, he was leading charity initiatives to raise funds for cancer, raise awareness for cancer. He was organizing meditation retreats for cancer patients that were struggling with him so that they could all grow together because that's what he was doing. So he was extending his practices out to them. Yeah. And he just lived with so much purpose in the last four years and so much service in the last four years. And yeah, that kind of mind is just unbelievable and phenomenal. Like you said, he's not famous. He doesn't have followers. No one knows who he is. Yeah. He's not having impacts on millions of people's lives, but everyone who knew him would say that he changed their life. Yeah, uh, what an honor to have been yeah, his well, best was, friend. Yeah, wow. we were, yeah, I was very lucky to, you know, he was kind enough to uh, be, be my best bud for, mm -hmm. a, for a few years. But anyway, when you're talking about Scott, I love that answer because I think it's so true that there are just so many people in the world who are going through enormously difficult things. And, and hearing their stories gives us so much faith. Yeah, and in part, I, I almost see my responsibility as uncovering the hidden stories. Um, yeah. there's, one, there's one interview I did just, just recently. Um, it was with a guy named Morgan. He, he was assigned female at birth, and he went through hormone therapy to align his body with his true gender identity, which is male. And for a while, Morgan is feeling intoxicated by the joy mm. and liberation that comes from being freed from his female body. He's a black man, and he said his joy was punctured when he was confronted with the harsh reality of what it means to be a black man in society. And his first confrontation with this was literally being pulled over by the police in his grandmother's driveway. Wow. And it's an incredibly um, insightful, thought-provoking set of reflections from Morgan because not only does he share what it means to have gone through this transition and, and um, you know, embrace his himself, um, but he ends up joining the force. He ends up becoming wow. a police officer. Wow. Um, and with the goal to reform it. Uh, and again, those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of stories that I live for, you yeah, know? And yeah. I want to hear them because I feel like, you know, I, we talked earlier about how being a cognitive scientist to me is like the greatest empathy builder. Yeah. Well, if you marry the science with storytelling, it's, it's an unbeatable combo in yeah. terms of, of empathy building and just understanding the full range of human experience. And um, yeah, I guess 
you could probably see it in my face. People can't see it, but I just love obsessed with having these interviews because I, I do feel like every single one I learn. It's not even that I learn something new. Mm -hmm. I learn a new way of interpreting the world around me. It's a perspective shift. Yeah. Um, and that's, I'm sure you find that when you, when you interview different people is it changes the perspective with which you look at the world. And that's an incredible gift to be given. Yeah. And it's totally unpredictable. Like when we started this conversation, it's di I felt different to when I first read about you and it's different to when now we're coming to the end of our conversation. It's yeah. like, we can have so many perceptions about someone and what we expect to learn from them. Yeah. And I can honestly say that sitting with you for the past hour, this has been a totally unexpected conversation <laughs> in a good way. And I'm like, I think that's the power of getting to listen to stories and listening to people and getting to meet people that you'd never meet before yeah. or otherwise, because I think we're so good at, and, and I guess that's where behavioral science is so interesting because we do have to box people to make sense of stuff, but then we need to unbox them <laughs> to actually make sense of them. Like it's well a said. it's a weird <laughs> yes. paradox, right? Like we almost put people in categories so that we can make decisions, yeah. but then we need to get them out of those to, to really deeply understand them. And so, you know, I wasn't expecting that our conversation would go down the journey that it yeah. has, but that's what's so beautiful about it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I want to, I want to thank you for, you know, doing your podcast uh for those of you who haven't listened to it go and check out a slight change of plans uh it's it's beautiful to hear these stories that you've even been sharing with us on the podcast and i can't wait for my audience to actually go and listen to some of these conversations i know i'm gonna do that because it sounds like you're just speaking to some people who and and in a way that you know is going to be really insightful for people's change and growth but also for their heart and i think that's what i love i i you're what I love about you from the little time that we've spent together is that it feels like you bring a lot of heart to science and uh, that's rare. Like it's, it's very rare. I feel like you, you're bringing your heart into how to help people change how they think. And so, you know, storytelling is one thing, but heartful storytelling is, is even a, a deeper step. So well, thank you for doing so, that. That's so kind and generous of you to say and such a compliment too. Um, I mean it. Because my hope is that I really can marry, you know, um, science and, and humanity, I guess. Mm, right. Mm. I mean, they're obviously really interconnected, but, um, that has been my goal with a slight change of plans. And it's kind of been my goal living, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> it's like, how do I bring my heart to as many things as I possibly can? So, um, yeah. it was such a pleasure to get to talk with you, Jay. I'm such a huge fan of your show and, um, I'm just, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. So thank uh, you. Well, thank you, Maya. Well, we're not done yet. We end every <laughs> interview, the final five. Oh, awesome. Uh, so this is the yeah. fast five round where every question has to be answered in one word or one sentence maximum. A sentence, I believe, or at least I've made this up as seven words maximum. So I don't <laughs> know if that's real or not, but seven to 10 words maximum. So this is your fast five, Maya. Okay. Uh, your first question is, what is the best advice you've ever received? Find amazing mentors. Great. I love that. That's a good one. And you, you shared so many wonderful examples of mentors that you've had in your life. And, Absolutely. And the amazing impact they've had on you. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy my rules here, but it's important to do that. Yeah. How do people find good mentors? Teach us that because, you know, I have my own, my own thoughts on this and I share that a lot with my audience, but I'd love to hear your perspective mm -hmm. on how people can find good mentors. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I've never done it intentionally. I've always mm. slipped into the mentee role almost without realizing it. Mm. But my mentors have played a profound role in my life. And the way that it happened, in case this is helpful to folks, is I'm always searching for people that I admire and whose life I would love to lead. Yeah. You know, and and who's who bring that kind of heart to things. Cause that's mm -hmm. something that speaks to me personally, for me, Maya, right? And then when I find those people, like Laurie Santos, mm -hmm. um, I just, I cling to them. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I say, oh, Laurie, like, you know, addition to you mentoring me, um, can I work in your lab? Can we get coffee? Can you actually be my lifelong friend? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I think um, as I've gotten older, one way to do that more effectively is I've just always, I mean, everyone has different philosophies on this, but I've always blurred, I've always blurred the line between colleague and friend. Yeah. And it's irresistible for me. It, I, I can't not bring that really personal side of myself to my work, no matter yeah. what it is that I'm working on. It's funny. There was a quick anecdote, just sorry, from, from my time in, in Obama's White House. So 
the government had just shut down and there were all these ethics rules about the fact that we couldn't hang out in our, quote, professional capacity. We could only hang out oh, in our wow. personal capacity because otherwise we'd be violating federal rules. Um, but we were just planning, we were, you know, we were all very friendly and we just wanted to hang out as friends. So mm -hmm. um, I was joking with folks. I was like, ah, I can't wait for all of you guys to see me in my personal capacity. <laughs> and, you know, one of my friends, Bess, is like, oh, Maya, you're exactly the same. Yeah. And then another one of my friends goes, we're still waiting to see Maya in her professional capacity. <laughs> so I think that says everything, which is yeah. I, I blur that line. And I think what ends up happening is I just like naturally end up becoming friends with the people I admire. Yeah. And then I find that they can be, that they have been just wonderful mentors. Yeah. Um, but it's always been, I know this might be unsatisfying for listeners to be like, oh, why did it have to be an organic process for you, Maya? I want the like one, two, three checklist. No, but no, no. I think that's kind of the only way for it to feel true. genuine. You know, you really want, to be friends with them because you're genuinely curious about the way they think and the way that they live. Yeah, I, I love that. And I and I love that that's your authentic, genuine way that it's happened. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. I think one of the most amazing things for me is that I genuinely believe you can be mentored by people you've never met. Mm. And so I've spent my life studying the lives, the words, the teachings of so many people that I admire that are no longer alive and simply sitting with their biographies and their autobiographies and listening to every interview and watching every TV show they went on or whatever they did, yeah. just looking at the records of their life. There's often times where I'll sit there and be like, well, what would that person do? There is an answer, it's somewhere yeah. there. And, and I've loved that because I would have loved to have been mentored by Martin Luther King or Steve Jobs or some of these people that I never got to meet. Mm -hmm. And I can be mentored by the people that met them or I can be mentored by them through their own lives if I studied them deeply mm -hmm. enough. And of course, I agree with you that I'd say any mentors that I've had in reality have not been calculated decisions. It's I agree with you. It's always been very natural. So yeah. I love that. I was You actually reminded me of something. I'm totally going off here. <laughs> no, but so but anyway, fun. your fast five has changed. <laughs> uh, you reminded me of something. You asked me that question about what trait has changed. Yeah. And you said something there that actually triggered something. You said uh, asking people to be my lifelong friend. So I've, I've always been very much wore my heart on my sleeve kind of person. Mm -hmm. I've always been that way because my mom raised me that way. And I always was honest with people. And often you were... You know, often when you're like that as a teenager, it's not a strength. It's seen as a weakness, like you're weird or you're strange or you're, you're needy or you're desperate or whatever it may be. And I never let go of it because I realized I would rather say what I really want to say to someone and then let it be whatever the result is yeah. versus not tell them the truth and then realize we could have been best friends. And so till this day... Uh, I've, I've got some of my closest friends in my life who, when I got to know them, the first thing I said to them was like, I really want to be friends with you. As a, tw Me too. As a 30 year old man. Oh my gosh, I love that and we're bonding. I do yeah. the same thing. I think yeah. it takes people aback, but yeah. I'm like, look, I may as well just be straightforward. You can say no. <laughs> totally, totally. And, I do this all the time. And I'm so okay with someone saying yeah. no. And actually I feel like I'm getting a much more honest take on like whether this is going anywhere. And now I'm not living in the woulda, coulda, shoulda, whatever. I'm living in okay, well, it didn't work and that's cool. Yeah. And, and I'm so much more happier with that sense of closure and now we're talking about relationships, <laughs> but it's like, I'm so much happier with having honest, transparent conversations rather than this idea in my head that, so anyway, you, that was the trait I think that I've learned yeah. to really see as a strength and, and not see as a weakness. And, you know, so I- Yeah, anyway. I think I have something very similar, which yeah. is I used to see- my openness maybe as weakness or something yeah, like yeah. that because I am so open with the people in my life yeah. that I love, um, even about just my affections for them, right? Yeah. Like I'll probably be writing you like a long email after this <laughs> being like, Jay, you're so amazing. Oh. Um, and it's all heartfelt. And yeah. I sometimes felt like, wow, you're so open. Yeah. And, um, it was, it was so interesting. I was at a wedding this weekend and, um, I was talking with one of my cousins. She was like, wow, Maya, you really asked these like deep questions of people. And my sister-in-law weighed in and she said, but Maya always gives you her full self in return. Yeah, She gives you that depth back. And I yeah. thought that was such a lovely thing to say because I do feel like in reinterpreting that openness as a weakness, I've seen it as, well, actually it's amazing to be able to share so much of yourself with someone else and hope that they can return yeah, that in whatever absolutely. capacity they're comfortable sharing themselves. Totally, totally. I love that. that, that I'm going to make that now the second question I ask you. What's the, uh, what do you think is a wonderful question to ask someone to evoke a connection and 
create a relationship with someone. If you if you had your favorite question to ask in mm. an interview or your favorite question to learn about someone, we're on the second question. So yeah, you can, you can, you can tell Seven words. Okay. Yeah. What have you changed your mind about? Oh, I love and that. then if I had nine words, I think that was seven. I'm not sure. And why? Okay. Beautiful. All right. Yep. Third question. What have you changed your mind about and why? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little bit meta, but it's totally true. I've changed my mind about why it is people believe the things they do. Mm. And that's been in studying the science of why it is that people believe the things they do. Mm. And I've always felt, this hits on some of the themes we talked about earlier, that if we can fully understand why, mm. then we can generate the how. How do mm. we change their minds given that if yeah. we think it's important for them to change their minds. Um, and what is the why usually? Where is, where is that come? Where do you think you see the patterns of why people think the way they do? Yeah. If there are any at all. Yeah, I think um, it relates a lot to the, the Daryl Davis story. Um, and it relates a lot to what I was sharing about tribal membership, which is yeah, at the end of the really day, I think one of our most primal human instincts is we want to feel like we belong to something we, that's bigger than ourselves, to a community, a group, something that validates us yeah. and where we feel an implicit sense that values are shared, yes. that there's commonality. Yeah. And understanding that, I mean, it sounds so simple. Oh, of course, some of my beliefs would be informed by my group membership. But if you really think about it, that does run counter to a lot of people's intuition about yeah. how it is that we generate our beliefs. And yeah. so I feel like once you understand that, that it's this human desire to belong, mm. um, you can then tailor make better solutions that mm. don't feel aggressive or confrontational or threatening in any way. I love that. Beautiful. All right. Question number four. Uh, what's the first thing you do in the morning and the last thing you do before you go to bed? Brush my teeth. So boring. But it's I fine. do. Totally fine. Um, it's needed. It is needed. You all need to brush Huge fan teeth. of, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. hygiene. Yeah. Um, you have great teeth. So, <laughs> thank so you. you brush your teeth. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's usually, it's usually eating a snack. Before, before bed? Before I go to bed, which is, I mean, you'll probably tell me it's a terrible bad health behavior. Teeth. Bad for your teeth. Yeah. As my wife um, would tell me. Yeah. I, what would be the snack? I'm intrigued now. I, I try to make it healthy. It's just, gosh, I was telling, um, <laughs> I was telling my friend Madeline on the way over, like, I get, I would, I wouldn't call it hanger. Yeah. I'd say I get heritable, if I can make that up. Cool. Okay? Yeah, you just made it up. I, yep. get, I get heritable. And no one likes me when I'm heritable. I don't like me when I'm heritable. So yeah. I just feel like I just need something to take a little bit of the hunger edge off. Yeah. Uh, so I'll have some sort of evening sex sometimes. Cool. I like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very heritable as well, and so is my wife. And we know when we're heritable, for sure. So I, I like that one. I just need to eat a bigger dinner. Oh, yeah. That's the key. I know I'm not supposed to eat right before bedtime, but yeah. I definitely can't fall asleep when I'm hungry. That's yeah. very hard for me. To that do. makes sense. Yeah. That, that definitely makes sense. <laughs> All right. Fifth and final question. And seeing as you worked in public policy, I think this will be fun. Yeah. Uh, if you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Smile at everyone you see on the street. That's beautiful. There is a lot of research showing how these small moments that strangers share can have profound impacts on well-being mm. and happiness and a mm. feeling of connectedness. And whether or not I'm having a good day, mm. I've, I make a, I make a self-commitment to smile at everybody that I see when yeah. I'm just taking a walk, acknowledge them in yeah. some way or another. Yeah. And it's been hard with COVID and masks and whatnot, but those moments brighten my day. Um, I hope they brighten the people that I'm smiling at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I just think, I, I think the world would be a much happier place if we could all find it within ourselves to just, to just do that small thing. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was such a great answer. Everyone, Maya Shankar, please, please, please go and listen to our podcast. We will put the link in the description below and the comments. Uh, Maya, it's been such a joy sitting with you. Honestly, I could talk to you for hours and hours <laughs> and, and I really do hope we get to spend a lot more time together. Me too. And, Thank you so much, uh, it's been It's been such a wonderful connection. I totally, this conversation has gone in so many new different directions that I know we haven't even uh, started uncovering, but I'm really, really excited to get to know you more and excited for my audience to connect with you more as well. So oh. thank you so much. And everyone who's been listening or watching wherever you are, make sure that you tag us both 
on Instagram to let us know your biggest insights, takeaways, any of the stories or studies that stood out to you. And please, please, please leave a review as well. And let me know that you heard this podcast specifically and how it moved you. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and watching. Maya, thank you so much for sharing so wonderfully. Thanks so much for having me, Jay. I appreciate uh, your time and I appreciate you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.